Traditional healers in South Africa have been practicing their art for thousands of years. From the preparation of herbal remedies known as muti, to providing spiritual and psychological guidance, sangomas and inyanyas, as they are known, have always played a vital role in their communities. Traditional healing, however, does have a dark side. A small minority of practitioners who would be called witch doctors do not give life. In fact, they take it. In August of 2003, police near the village of Kliphat in the Northwest province were alerted to a body. It was clearly a female. However, various body parts were missing, including the head. Upon initial discovery, police were inclined to ask the question, was this in fact the work of a witch doctor? Was this what South Africans would call a muti murder? My name is Malikwa Simandla. Um, I come from a place called Sibokeng in the Val. That's where my name comes from because Malikwa, it actually comes from the Val River. So I'm the Val River. So yeah, that's what my grandmother said to me, that you are the Val River because the Val River, you can look that it's going to get dry. The next day it will be full. That's you. Do you come from a tradition of traditional healers? Yes, I do. From my mother's side, they are traditional healers, they are sangomas, they are prophets. Yes. So it's a different types of healers from my mother's side. My name is Tato Mosesi. I am a traditional healer, also known as Inyanga. Inyanga. Yeah, so there's a difference between a sangoma and an Inyanga. What is an Inyanga? And Inyanga gets exposed to, there's this one spirit that teaches you more about herbs. And Inyanga doesn't have to, well, I, the ones I've been exposed to, you don't have to chant. That's the difference, Sangomas chant. Oh. They heal through chanting, they heal through drums and drumming. So it's the sequence of the drumming that does the healing. It's the chanting that, that does the healing. Right. And whoever's ancestor that's here, or whoever's visiting us at the current moment, who has an ancestor who loves the drumming, will respond spiritually. Oh. So that's the difference. My name is Tamisi Mandla. Uh, I'm a pastor with the Methodist Church in Africa. I joined the ministry in 1999 at the age of 25 years old. What are some of the practices that somebody follows, who follows a, a Muti lifestyle? What do, how do they live their lives? Uh, they live their lives as normal people. In this case, when we say Muti in the African context, we will call it Muti in the sense that a person uses it for medicinal purposes, number one. Number two, a person can use muti if one wants to empower him or herself financially, or if one wants to be respected in the community, one would use muti. Uh, others would use muti uh, for, for protection. Others would use muti to repel evil spirits. That's how people use muti in general. Do, do uh, many Sangomas or most Sangomas uh, come from a line of uh, an ancestry of Sangomas? Um, yes, I would say so. So it's something that passes it's down? It's something that passes down. It's a calling, actually. It is a calling whereby it's a calling from the ancestors. Yes, the ancestors most are the people who have been living before that have passed. So now they come back now in a spiritual form and they want you to um, carry through what they couldn't. Yes, that's how it comes. You talked earlier about uh, it, it being a calling from the ancestors. Mm -hmm. Do you remember being called? Is it a moment or was it a feeling you already you always had? Uh, it's not a feeling that one has, but it's something that you will never understand because it comes differently. Um, like it, it, it depends on how it comes. You know, it differs from one person to another on how the person is called. So my calling started when I was very, very young. Um, and um, I, I wasn't aware of it until 2006, whereby I started getting sick 
and we couldn't understand what was going on with me. And we could, uh, we, we, we went to the doctors and the doctors couldn't see anything. And until I got dreams now, yes, and I would see things that no one could see. I would hear things that nobody else could hear. So I had to be trained. So being a Sangoma or a traditional healer, you don't just become one, but you need to be trained so that you may understand what is happening. You may understand how you get the visions and how to control them and how to use them as well. My name is Mfondo Ndala. I am a South African true crime YouTuber. On my channel, I cover primarily South African serial killers, but I also take special interest in crimes of the occult. Do you recall uh, uh, the first time you heard about this case? So the first time I heard of it was very recently. I think it was about three or four years ago when I was researching occult crimes and just researching um, Muti murders in general. The reason that I came across this case was because I was researching a different case that involved a young girl who was murdered, a young girl with albinism. And that's a, a lot of the times these crimes take place against people who do have albinism or very young people as well, because those people's body parts are believed to hold even extra special powers um, in the black magic community. In August of 2003, police had been called to the dump site of an unidentified female. Of course, identifying a body whose head has been removed poses some challenges. Ultimately, it was a scar on the victim's leg that indicated to police that tragically, this was in fact one of their own. The victim was Inspector Vilamina Mklangu of the Kliphat Police. How had their colleague come to be killed and disposed of in such a callous way? The police would surely only find solace in swift justice. A body had been discovered. The head, the breasts, and the genitals were removed. The unfortunate victim, it turned out, was none other than one of the Kliphat police's own. Her name? Inspector Vilamina Mklangu. Upon initial inspection, police considered the idea that this may be a Muti murder. Muti, or traditional medicine, can, after all, include the use of human body parts. These are considered by some who practice dark magic to be the most potent forms of Muti. So it is not atypical to find a body in South Africa whose parts have been harvested for use in dark traditional remedies. However, in this case, certain things immediately pointed to the fact that this may not be a murder for Muti. How do these, um, uh, uh, how do body parts, or how are they collected? How does any of this take place? So in order to understand the end result of a Muti murder, we need to understand how it begins. And usually it begins with a client going to a Sangoma. And it's obviously not going to be Inyanga because Inyanga is not dealing with ancestors. They're dealing purely in the medicinal parts of traditional healing. So a client goes to a Sangoma with a problem saying what they have their problem in, whether they want more wealth, they want protection, they want respect. It's really ever for protection, more for wealth and, and um, respect and for also sexual powers. And that's going to play into which body parts are collected. So the client is involved and then the Sangoma themselves who would either suggest that they harvest body parts or the client would suggest that they harvest the body parts. But neither the Sangoma nor the client are involved in the harvesting of these body parts. A third party is involved. That person would be the hitman that is hired by the Sangoma and paid for by the clients to commit these crimes. And it's, it's not a, a large amount of money that these people are hired for. Some, it's sometimes between about 1,000 Rand to 5,000 Rand. There is times when it's about 10,000 Rand, which translates to about 700 Canadian dollars, which it's not a lot of money in the grand scheme of things. No, it's really It's not. maybe like rent for one month. And the purpose of a muti murder is not to commit a murder, it's to take the body parts while the person is still alive. Alive? Yes. What sort of practices do you uh, use as a Sangoma? 
I use bones. Um, firstly, it depends on the patient. Yeah. When the patient comes in, like I said, I'm a traditional healer, I'm a prophet, I'm also a sangoma. So um, I get different patients. So it depends on my ancestors, on the reading, on what type of healing a person needs. Because of some people do not need uh, muti, where is the traditional healing um, thing. And some people, they only need you to use prayer on them and water. So it depends on the patient's needs, on the reading, on what is it that you need to do for that uh, particular person. Talk to me about throwing bones. I've heard of it, but how, how do you actually do that? Okay. When you throw bones, you talk to your ancestors and there's this person that is here to get a reading and you ask them for guidance so that they can reveal what is the problem or what is she or he here for. So then you throw the bones. When you start throwing the bones, the ancestors talk through you. Then you read those bones and then you talk to the person. What, what kind of bones do you use? Uh, different types of bones. Yeah. It's different types of bones depending on what your ancestors gave you. Remember, this is a calling. So you don't do as you wish. You do following your ancestors' um, directions. Right. So if they gave you, maybe let's say, a cow's bone and a goat's bone, and that's all you're gonna use. So some they use, only, maybe some, um, maybe they use a dices. So it depends on what your ancestors give to you. And that is the tricky part because you need to listen to them and do as they say. There are um, more acceptable medicines that are used and then there's a dark side of yes. uh, Muti medicine. Yeah. Can you lead me down that path a little bit? What are some of the more shocking Muti medicines that have been used in the past? Sure. Okay, I'm gonna get very explicit. Though. Please do. So, for an example, when you start going dark, you start using the blood of a living organism, be it an animal or a human being. So if it's got blood in it, then now you've you've literally signed a contract with the darkness. Yeah. Anything that's got blood in it, menstrual blood, hair, skin. So anything that forms the DNA of either a human being or a creature, but it also depends on the mandate. So if for an example, you want to summon a zombie, we call it a dogoloshi, where you, you are literally inventing your own little human that you will control. And you are like, they are, their God, and you send them to do whatever they, you want them to do. That you'd need to put together the DNA of a creature. Some people choose the hairs of a hyena. Why? Um, if you go to a place where there's hyenas, you easily fall asleep. The hairs have that effect on you. Now, imagine if you burn those hairs, everybody's gonna sleep, you know? You use that so that it's not picked up when it does appear you won't pick it up because you'll be fast asleep. It only makes sense to use that. Right. You'll use uh, some human bone because you want the structure of it to be of human-like. You'll use uh, the saliva maybe of a dog. So it's a lot of things. Sometimes even things like, if the, you know most you get, when your eyes get dirty and you get some of those crummy looking stuff on the eyes, dogs also have that. Mm -hmm. That's also used. Really? Yes, it's used to see beyond the multiple verses, the multiple realms. Because remember, a dog can see way better at night than it does during the day. So, and it sees more activity at night than it would during the day. So imagine if I had to use that on you, what are you going to see? And will it leave you in a proper state mentally? You know, so once you go dark, you are taking the, the blood or rather the DNA of a li living organism, right. either a creature or a human being. How common is it for traditional healers to use human body parts to this day? Well, I'd like to think that currently it's becoming a common thing. Before it never was, but if you look at the numbers of trafficking, we keep blaming other countries, but I always say the problem is not too far. Where there's smoke, there's usually fire. Right. 
So it's not as common. I can't say it, it is common. I wouldn't, I, I've never been exposed to using or even seeing a human body part in this field. I've seen it at a hospital and all those things, but just not in this field. But I believe it's becoming common because of the gains that, the benefits you get from harvesting body parts or using them in some of the things that you do. Wilhelmina Mahlangu's cause of death was found to be multiple gunshot wounds. There were five bullet wounds in her body. Four had an entrance and exit wound, but there was one, however, which was still lodged in the body. It was sent for further analysis. The fact that the victim was shot indicated that this was not a Muti killing. For Muti to be potent, it must be harvested from a live victim. Villamina had been shot and then the body parts removed post-mortem. So what, in fact, had happened to her? Was this actually a case of someone trying to cover their tracks? Why alive? So the belief is that um, they need to harvest these body parts with the life essence still intact so that they are able to transfer the magic and the power in these body parts into the Muti medicine. That's horrific. Um, how often does this occur? So unfortunately, we don't have exact statistics on how often it occurs because multi murders are classed under all general murders in South Africa. But they do garner a lot of attention because of the how gruesome they are and the brutality of it. I would say it's between anywhere from five to 500 in a year multi murders that occur in South Africa. That's a pretty broad range. That's a very big range because we don't have the numbers. We don't have any way to, to count which it is. And a lot of them are fake multi murders. So we don't know which ones are real and which ones are fake. And a lot of them are happening in extremely rural areas, extremely impoverished areas with lack of resources, lack of, of police services yeah. in those areas as well. Uh, lead me through what uh, uh, an assailant would do when um, uh, undergoing the harvesting of body parts and, and, and murdering somebody for, for, for genuine Muti purposes. So the assailant would be given the name of the victim or the description of the victim. And the victim needs to be someone who, whatever they are taking from the victim needs to be related to what the muti will be used for. Yeah. So for example, they might take a, they might kill a sex worker and harvest her sexual organs in order to give the recipient, the client, um, sexual powers, for example. Or they might take someone who is well respected in the community and they will take that person's head and use their head for multi purposes because the head is a sign of respect. And that's the part that would garner the magic of respect. And if it's maybe children who are lucky or who people who are, are lucky with, with money, an another type of victim might be someone who is someone who's well loved in the community and their heart might be taken so that the recipient of this muti is, is garnered the, the magic of love to be loved by other people. Uh this is a concept I'm trying to wrap my head around. How are the body parts used in different ways, I assume? So, yes, they are used in different ways, but as with general multi-medicine, when you use herbs, you incorporate it into the medicine itself. So you incorporate it, you mix it in with the herbs. You mix in their liver or their stomach or their heart or their parts of their hands, the bones in their hands. You mix it into the herbs and either the client is told that they need to wear something with these body parts in them, like a, a bottle with the body parts in them, or they need to put it on as, as topical ointment, or they need to sometimes even ingest the body parts as well. So there's also an element of cannibalism to it as well. So it can be just keeping items uh, nearby, it can be applying them to the body, and it can be actually Ingesting them consuming as well. them. When did this murder take place? This particular murder took place in August of 2003. What happened was um, the naked body of a female was found and she, was, she had been beheaded. And a member from the Mabopane community came across this body and um, he went to his community leader to inform him of what was happening because Mabopane being such an impoverished community, 
they end up having their own policing forums to be able to limit the amount of crime that happens. So the first red flag that comes up in this being a fake Muti murder is the fact that it was a naked female body. Usually when Muti murder occurs, the bodies are not fully undressed because there's no sexual element to it. They only remove the parts of clothing that are necessary to gain access to the body parts that they need. Right. So her being completely naked was already showing that this might not be what it is being made out to be. Other than her head, were there other body parts missing? Yes, so um, her breasts had also been removed as well as the external parts of her vagina. We know in this crime um, that the victim's genitals were harvested, yeah. her breasts were harvested, yeah. and her head was missing. Yeah. What would uh, the genitals and the breasts normally be used for in uh, Muti medicine and in a Muti killing? Why would they harvest this? Dark rituals, the things, the very things that we see on TV and movies, and we just laugh at and think, ah, that's so ridiculous. So for an example, I'd want a head right at my gate to make sure, because that's my camera. Uh -huh. you, that's my spiritual camera, uh -huh. do you get me? And then when we go into the private parts, those are much more darker rituals when a lot of males would be involved or a lot of females would be in, involved. Mm -hmm. So it, it's sort of like a cult. When you collect these parts, whoever wants these parts is popping out a lot of money for them. Otherwise, you wouldn't go and kill somebody and get just their vagina for nothing. Right. So somebody, there's somebody, there's people in very high ranks. I can't say I know them. All I know is that why would a common, like an old lady from Soweto who has nothing, kill their daughter, take the vagina and just harvest it? No, there's, there's no way. It's either there's a business deal, so it's like a bounty. Put out a bounty, you say I got $100,000 and I want uh, the vagina of a black woman and she needs to be between this age range. Age range is also vital because the younger she is, the better. If she's a virgin, it's even better because it's a powerful muti. Mm -hmm. Now, if she's not a virgin, well, it won't be as strong because you've been exposed to sin. The more innocent, even better. Right. So it's it's blood rituals. It's blood rituals, which I think it's uh, giving power to these dark entities that we know nothing about. So uh, uh, the body's found. Uh, police are called, um, what's it, what happens next? So the body was found and then the community leader was called first. Then the community leader contacted police and they took fingerprints of the victim and sent them over to Home Affairs because Home Affairs has everybody's fingerprints right. um, in South Africa. Well, and everybody's documents that their fingerprints are on the Home Affairs system. So, um, were they able to find out who the, the victim was rapidly? Uh, no, unfortunately, they weren't able to find it out through Home Affairs. The discovery of the victim's identity actually came from her colleagues. In relation to the murder of Vilamina Plongo in the town of Kliplat, if police analysis was correct, and this was not, in fact, a Muti murder, then what could explain her dismemberment? Police were left to consider that this may be an effort to disguise the identity of the body and thus delay the investigation. Of course, the fact that the victim was one of their own motivated police to make sure that nothing stood in the way of bringing the perpetrator to justice. She was a police officer and um, a very well-respected police officer at that. And she was a responsible person who was always at work on time, if not early. If she was not going to be coming into work, then she would tell her colleagues that she's not coming in. So she was late for one of her shifts and um, her partner informed their superintendent that, um, hey, my partner, Wilhelmina Mashangu, she hasn't come into work today. Something is wrong. This isn't like her. And from there, they... They were the police, not from the same community that was responsible for Mabopane, but a neighboring community. And at the time when the police that were dealing with this investigation, they went to see if there were any missing people that were reported. And they hadn't yet put out a description of what had happened. So it went through internal affairs. It was an internal thing of there's been a body found. You guys are saying that one of your colleagues is missing. Why don't you come to the mortuary and see if this could be her? So her partner went with another colleague to the mortuary to see if this could be um, 
Ulamina Masango, and when he arrived, he knew instantly that it was her, and he was able to identify her by a scar on her leg. So in this case, we know the victim's vagina and breasts were, were removed. Her head was removed. It looked very much like uh, what was left after uh, a Muti killing. Yeah. When they found the victim's head at the perpetrator's home, there was a bullet hole in it. What does that tell you? That was just a, a crime that went wrong. He just got angry. He shot her, then panicked after and decided, no, I didn't do this, I'm gonna hide it. Does that happen often? Is, is Muti medicine and the harvesting of Muti medicine used to cover up homicides in South Africa? Well, all I can tell you is that a lot of people are now seeking help in that faculty now. Yeah. It's now easier. So for example, um, your wife is seeing somebody else and you really want to get rid of this guy. You come see me, we draft a plan. They won't, they won't be able to tell, you know, we draft a plan, we sort of um, fake kill her, kidnap her and kill her elsewhere. Like so much of conjuring, but it's also because of how, um, how well traditional healers are able to hide these. It's, it's much easier actually to go to them, not realizing that an alchemist, a scientist and a traditional healer all practice the same things. Herbs and conventional medicine is one thing. That is why uh, upon investigation and investigation, they will find out the truth because if it's a multi killing, the truth will always come out purely because of the fact that even the person that you kill, that person has ancestors mm. and they also don't like it. And they'll do whatever it takes to have the truth come out. Might not be now, but the truth will always come out. Uh, uh, so once the body is identified, um, how does the investigation um, expand from there? So after the body was identified, well, just to, let's go back a little bit. Before sure. the body was identified, there were certain things at the crime scene that was taken as forensic evidence. So there was tire tracks, um, some fingerprints from the victims were obviously taken, as well as um, the parts of clothing that were around, if there was any around, they took some of that as well. And they did a cast and they sent it in for forensics to have it on the database. And thereafter, when the body was identified, the police officers from Wilhelmina's department, they went to her home to see what had happened. Was anybody home? There was no one home at the time. And another thing that was strange about the crime scene was the lack of blood and the fact that there were bullet wounds in the body. There were four bullet wounds in the body. Wait, you told me that, or from what I know, um, uh, a muti killing, uh, the organ, the body parts need to be harvested while somebody's alive. Yes. So, unless they were shot after the body parts were harvested, it doesn't really make sense. And there was no blood there. Yes. So that's that's how we were, well, the police were able to figure out that this is a staged scene because there wasn't any blood and usually um, in a Mutsi killing, you're not gonna move the body from where you committed the crime. You take what you need and you leave it there and then it's discovered and the process follows. But with this, it had been clear that the place that the body was found was not the scene of the crime because there was no blood. And the fact that it was obvious that she had died prior to her organs being harvested and her body parts being harvested because of the fact that there were bullet wounds and obviously forensic testing, they were able to figure out that these were post-mortem wounds as well. If somebody murders somebody, clearly they're going to fall out of favor with the ancestors. If somebody murders somebody and then fakes a muti killing, is that even worse? That's even worse. That, for this is just my own opinion. In that instance now, you no longer have guides walking with you. You've become a baseless human being because you've lost the very thing that actually keeps you going, which is your humanity. You know, that, that feeling of guilt and remorse, that's actually the driving force in any human soul. Once you lose that, you are literally the walking dead. You're just short of your heart stopping to beat and then being buried. But I, at the rate that things are going now, people are going for the darker side because I, I strongly believe there's a bad energy in the air. And we struggle to discern between good and bad with everything that's happening. And personally, I also think as traditional healers is praying. We don't, we have not made it like a, 
the, the, the most important thing to do as a tradition, like anybody else, even as a priest, with anything that you do, even with doctors, when you go into that operating room, you pray right. that God gives you the strength to be able to save this life. Right. The same thing should apply with us. But remember, it's such an ego-stroking gift. You know, when people say, oh my goodness, you could tell me this, that, and that, the other happened and nobody knew about it. I mean, people start worshiping you. What happens to your ego? It starts growing bigger and bigger. And once now those compliments go away, you want more of them. You'll do whatever to get more of them. Mm -hmm. Then you start selling lies. Then automatically you, you, you're, you're de-rooting. And when you de-root, you've left your ancestors where you were and you've gone in, into that route alone because they don't do that. If really they are good people and they are of white light, then you've, you've lost your ancestors. I personally think then there is no calling. When it comes to the dark side of uh, uh, Muti, if it was not for the demand for people wanting these, these, these things, um, uh, would those crimes still exist? Um, not really. Uh, can I say I blame this on poverty as well? Because poverty is the effect, it's, it's the one that, uh, that, that puts us here now. Uh, because of the, the crimes of Muti related, that are Muti related, they are due to poverty because now people want quick money. People want quick money and then now they revert to Muti now for that, you know. And I want to say um, other traditional healers, we had the case before, um, in our, we have an association as the traditional healers. So whereby we had a case whereby the, the, there was this healer that was confronted by, by these um, killers, I'd say, and they said to, to, to the lady, you need to do as muti. If you don't do that, we're going to kill you. So she had to do that because of she wanted to save her life. Right. So some of the things that the, the traditional healers are doing, they are not doing it out of their own will but because of their pressure, because of the society that we live in is very cruel. Police investigating the murder of Vilamina had found their way to her home. Outwardly, there was no obvious evidence of a struggle. However, under closer inspection and after the discovery of her head, police had concluded that Vilamina was in fact murdered in her own home. Evidence indicated that she was killed in her bed. The mattress, headboard, and mirror were riddled with bullet holes. Police had also discovered two nine millimeter firearms in the bedroom. They were both found beneath blue overalls, which were clearly those of a man. Whose guns were these? And who owned the overalls? Police were getting closer to answers. So other than what the crime scene is telling them, the body has likely been moved, it wasn't, uh, the killing didn't occur uh, there, they don't really have a whole uh, many leads to, uh, to go on. So they go to, uh, Willa, they go to the officer's house. Yes, they go to Wilhelmina's house, and when they walk in, um, everything is normal. Do they need a search warrant to walk in or can they just walk in? Well, they didn't have a search warrant. So because at this point in time, it was her colleagues coming in, not necessarily conducting an investigation, but as concerned friends, even though they had already gone to identify her body, they should have probably gone in from the get go as an investigator, but they didn't do that. But they were still careful at the crime scene because of the fact that they were police officers. Right. So they walk into the crime scene and they discover that everything looks normal. It doesn't look like there's any blood anywhere. It's very clean. The kitchen was clean. The spare bedroom was clean. The main bedroom was a little bit messy, but there wasn't any visible blood that the naked eye could see at that point in time. So uh, uh, they're in the house. Everything looks OK. What changes? What changes is the fact that Wilhelmina had a boyfriend. And when they spoke to the boyfriend, they said, um, where is she? Because they, they don't want to tip him off of the fact that they've already found her body. Because obviously with, with cases like this, the first suspect is always going to be the partner of the victim. 
So the boyfriend then told the police he doesn't know where she is. They should be the ones that know where she is since she's their friend and their colleague. He has no idea where she could be. And he didn't really show any concern to the fact that people are telling him that his girlfriend is missing. So that was a huge red flag and that raised suspicions with police. And upon further investigation and when they were conducting forensic tests in the house, they discovered that there was blood in the bedroom. Not only were, was there blood in the bedroom, but there were um, four, there were three bullet holes in the bedroom itself, in different parts of the bedroom. So remember, she'd been shot four times. Right. Three of them had an entrance and an exit wound, and one of them, one of the bullets was still lodged in the body. The police are in the house. Uh, they uh, find, they, they find blood in, in the house. To me, though, if the murder occurred there, they find bullet holes there as well. If the murder occurred there, wouldn't it be a really horrific, bloody scene? How was it covered up? The boyfriend had already cleaned the the house by the time that the police came. Yeah. Because the police only came about three or four days after the initial discovery of the body. And on their initial visit, the first time that they came without the proper equipment and the warrant, they found um, two guns in the house. One gun was registered to her, it was her police-issued firearm, and the second gun was registered to her boyfriend, which is what gave them the motivation to come back a second time. And on their second visit, that's when they made the discovery of the bullet holes, and that's when they made the forensic discovery of the blood, because that's when they came with the correct equipment to, to test the scene of the crime. Two firearms discovered in the home of Vilamina Mahwangu, a police officer who had been murdered in her bed with a gun, were found in the room where she died. Police immediately set about identifying who the guns were licensed to. One was Vilamina's police issue weapon. The other was registered to a man named Bali Ntuli. Police, of course, knew who he was. He was Vilamina's boyfriend, and he was clearly somebody they needed to talk to. Was there anything else they found in the house? They did find um, the victim's body parts. They found her head, her breasts, and her external vagina. Wait a second. The, 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 somebody has cleaned up this. We, we now know that the perpetrator had cleaned up the scene, but left body parts? Yes, he left them in a plastic bag in the fridge. Very Jeffrey Dahmer. Is there any indication of why he did that? I think it was just so that it wouldn't stink. And it wouldn't like, so that he, he had some time to dispose of these items properly. Well, he cleaned up the, 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 the crime scene. I do not know why. Yeah, uh, what does this tell you about the, um, uh, the, the, the perpetrator, that he kept the body parts? He didn't understand that I need to clean up, but I need to dispose of these things. I, th I think it was just a, he didn't expect to be caught so quickly. Right. I think it was just, it was just timing. He just had a poor understanding of the limited amount of time he had to get rid of the evidence. Because although there wasn't a lot of blood um, in the bedroom, it wasn't like a horrific bloody scene, they were only able to see it under UV light after doing the forensic testing. But the sheets themselves, they, they were torn you could see that there'd been a knife there where someone had, that's where he, he actually dismembered her, was on the bed itself. So you could see in the sheets that he had cut her head off and you could see the serrations of the knife on the sheets themselves. So at this point, we've got a uh, crime scene. We have body parts uh, recovered. How do investigators um, confront the suspect with this? So they, arrest him for suspicion of murder. And at first he's like, no, it wasn't me. This is a multi murder, as you can see. But um, very soon after his arrest, he admitted to the crime. And he said that he killed her in self-defense. So according to him, on the night of the murder, she had come home from a local shabin or a, a local hangout. And he confronted her about the fact that she was allegedly seeing other men, according to him, that she was having affairs with other men. And she, according to him, he then um, was attacked by her in saying that she was gonna kill him. She told him that she was gonna shoot him. And she went into the bedroom where she kept her firearm. And at the time he had his firearm on his, on his hip. So he took out his firearm and went into the bedroom and he shot her. 
and she was lying on the bed like forensic evidence and ballistic evidence shows that she was lying on the bed at the time of the murder because the, there was like a downward angle to the shots they were able to determine that it was fired downwards and at an angle yeah. meaning that she was lying down and he was lying on top of her so if it was self-defense then you would expect that maybe she would have discharged her firearm right. but when they did testing on her firearm they found that her firearm hadn't been discharged because you can tell when a firearm has been discharged recently. This counteracted his alibi that it was self-defense and that uh, uh, as he entered the room, she yes. pointed a gun at him. Yeah, because the gun was found, remember when they found the gun, it was found in the drawer. So if she had pointed the gun at him, why would he not, why would he leave the gun? If, why would he put it back in the drawer? Why wouldn't he leave it where police can then say, okay, fine, she was on the bed with a gun. She was trying to shoot you. Right. And then um, he says that after he shot her four times, he realized what he had done and he put her in the car and he started driving towards a hospital. But before they got to the hospital, he realized that she was unresponsive and she was dead. And he was calling out to her throughout this because he didn't want her to be dead. He was scared that he had killed his girlfriend, even though he knew what he did. And he went out into an open field, dug a shallow grave. And he then says that that's when he disposed of her body. But forensic evidence shows that she was dismembered in the home. Mm. So if he's saying that he dismembered her at the cry at the the crime scene that they initially found, then there would have been more blood from the dismemberment, which right. wasn't there. There wasn't any blood on the crime scene. Police were not short of evidence that indicated Bali Natuli had murdered their colleague, Vilamina Mahlangu. Ballistic tests on his gun proved that it was the murder weapon. DNA evidence from his car proved that he had moved her body. The simple fact is that the sheer quantity of evidence against him left in Thule not much else to do but confess. With everything needed to charge him, police were left simply with one question, why? Unfortunately, domestic and gender-based violence is one of South Africa's most pressing issues. In the case of the murder of Vilamina Mahlangu, whose body was mutilated in order to mislead police into thinking it was a Muti killing, police had now proved that it was her boyfriend who had in fact killed her in her own home. But why? Well, the suspect would claim self-defense. Apparently, an argument had gotten out of hand and he'd been forced to shoot her when she threatened to shoot him. It would be left to the evidence to prove otherwise. Why was he lying about where he dismembered her? I think he was just trying to still have that alibi of self-defense. Because if he says that he killed her, dismembered her, and then drove her body out of the, the house, right. it, it brings into question, why didn't you try and go to the hospital? That's why he said he put her in the car to try and take her to the hospital. But when he realized that she was dead, he dug a shallow grave, dismembered her, and brought her body parts back home. How did he explain why he dismembered her? He did not. How long did this take to apprehend the felon? Like a week. Just a week? Yeah, it was, it was very quick. It was a, a cut and dry case. It was oh. very obvious what had happened. And luckily, the police officers that were working on this were quite competent. Um, I, well, we can say that it took a week to apprehend him because he was in custody. But obviously, it took a little bit longer for the forensic evidence to be verified because right. they still had to um, take the plaster casts from the tire tracks of the original crime scene and compare them to his own tires of his own car. And they also had to do ballistics on his, his weapon as well as the bullet that they found in her body. They had to do ballistic testing on that. So to conclude the case itself took a little bit of time. However, the arrest and the confession happened within a week. So. Her partner, Bali, um, uh, has admitted to the murder, but uh, claims it's in self-defense. Talk to me about the trial and how it was uh, proved otherwise. So it was proved in trial due to the forensic evidence of specifically the ballistic evidence and showing that um, it couldn't have been self-defense due to the position of the victim as well as the position of the perpetrator when he fired the gun. And it was a quick trial because he he pled, I can't remember his, his plea, 
but the trial didn't take very long and he was found guilty of murder and sentenced to life imprisonment, which sounds fancy, but in actuality, it's just 15 years. Like you just have to serve a minimum of 15 years before you're eligible for parole. Right, you are you are uh, in the system for life and you are monitored, but you can actually be freed after uh, yes. 15 uh, years. So uh, Bali uh, is sentenced to 15 years. Did he ever accept his guilt? Did he ever change his story? Or does he still maintain his innocence? He still maintains that it was in self-defense. In self-defense. What are the uh, what are some of the learnings and generalizations that come out of this case that uh, that you've come to understand? Um, when you are presented with a case that seems like a multi murder, don't immediately assume that it is a multi murder. Do the due diligence that it deserves to find the perpetrator because if they had treated this as a multi murder, he could be walking free today. He would not have been brought to justice as swiftly as he was. Of the number of multi murders every year, uh, uh, what, how, many, how often are they staged? We can't say because we don't know how many they are and we don't know how many are real or how many are fake. Because of the low occurrence of the amount of Sangomas who are willing to commit these types of crimes, I would personally say, it's my personal opinion, that majority of them are staged. As a result of diligent and focused police work and simply following the clues, police had apprehended the killer of Inspector Vilamina Mahlangu in just 48 hours. Bali and Tuli grossly underestimated the quantity of evidence that he'd left behind. In this case, police were in fact able to debunk every claim that the offender made. Science had stripped the investigation down and only the truth remained. In a jealous rage, at the hands of someone who should have cared for her, Vilamina had lost her life. It is a story that we hear all too often it is a story that, sadly, we will hear again.